subject. We're going to look at the subject of spiritual authority. If you can put the slides up, technical, please. This is a kind of continuation from the series we did on um, spiritual authority. How many of us were here when we talked about spiritual authority? Praise God. Hallelujah. So now we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Um, this will just be an introduction. It is not something we can finish in one session. So we'll probably have three at least three sessions on, on it. Um, our text is taken from Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter. The book of Ephesians and the sixth chapter. And I will be reading from the New Living Translation version. Chapter 10. Are we there? Ephesians and the 6th chapter. I am reading the NLT version, the New Living Translation version. I read. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The New King James Version says, For we wrestle, for we wrestle, for we do not wrestle, sorry, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, NLT. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, some translations say, take up the whole armor of God. So you will be able to resist the enemy in time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news, so you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of this, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Verse 19. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plans. That the good news is for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Verse 20. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we are talking about spiritual authority. And just to summarize what the text we have read, um, is talking about a quick summary. One, there is a spiritual war. Whether you are aware of it or not, <laughs> there is a spiritual war. Whether you know it or not, 
there is a spiritual war. But the good news is there's a divine weapon for that, to combat that. And who is this spiritual war against? The battle is with the organized army of Satan, who we can't see. It's not a visible war. So you're fighting with the unseen. It is not of flesh, and it is in the heavenly realms. And the text also tells us that without utilizing the weapons, the whole armor that has been provided for us, we can't stand firm. You can't take one and not take the other. That's why it says, take on the whole armor of God. And of course, as we started the reading in verse 10, it says, be strong in the Lord. So yes, the path of the battle is not ours. That's from God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the way Paul had written the, the book of um, Ephesians, you know, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians talks about what we have as, as Christians. And then the final three chapters talks about what we are supposed to do as Christians. And if you notice in verse 10, he started with finally. He's rounding it up and giving us the key things, finally. So it shows that it's very important. <coughs> so like I said earlier, we are in a spiritual war. And sometimes think about it and ask yourself. Sometimes you find yourself in situations where you really want to come to church. You've planned to come to church. But suddenly your body says, oh, I'm tired. And then you don't come. Do you think it's ordinary? Do you think it's ordinary? It's not. That's your flesh warring against your spirit. <laughs> it's not ordinary. Or how about days where you're doing Bible study, or you're finding it difficult to do Bible study? Or how many of us have started praying at 10 p.m. and then we wake up at 2 a.m. and we're on our knees, we've slept in between. <laughs> You're laughing. Do you think it's ordinary? It's not. It's not ordinary. There is some, something or s someone, if I should call him someone, warring against you. There's something behind it. There's a force worrying against you, making sure you do not get hold of the promises of God, making sure you do not spend time studying the Word of God, making sure you do not spend time praying, making sure you do not spend time getting the results you need to get, making sure you do not spend time building that relationship with God, making sure you miss that revelation. Today we're talking about revelation, the transforming Word, there's something behind it. It's not ordinary. And then you hear, oh, Pastor, I really wanted to come. Honestly, I really wanted to come. But when I go home, I just sat down. I was so tired. And that's why I didn't come. It's not ordinary. If you didn't know, know now, it is not ordinary. Because the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you. The Bible says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to focus on verse 10 to 13, because we really can't do everything now. So I'll read verse 10 to 13 again. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle, I've written the New King James Version now, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, <coughs> against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you go back to the slides, please. One thing we need to, to understand is everything we see, the next slide, you, you, technical, you need to flow with me. Yeah? Everything we see in the physical, it's always preceded by something in the, in the spiritual. So the spiritual comes before the physical. What you see in the physical is just a manifestation. Everything has taken place already in the spiritual. That's very important. Everything happens in the spiritual. So there's battle waging in the heavens. There is battle waging in the heavens. Either to bring things to manifestation or to withhold things from being manifested. Either way. Praise the Lord. So when we talk about spiritual warfare. It's an active warfare. It's not a passive one. It's an active warfare. And it's against us Christians. You and I. So it's not something that just happens to pastors. No. The warfare is not for pastors. Even you. In your everyday life. There's warfare. It's not a pastor thing. Praise the Lord and I thank God for that. <laughs> And why is the devil doing this? Because he wants to stop us. He wants to stop the work of God. He wants to stop the redeeming action of the blood of Jesus. He wants to stop all that. So that's why there's this constant war. But the good news is, we already have the victory. So we're fighting from a different position. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a position of victory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you look at Colossians 2, 13, well, I'll just pop onto verse, okay, let me read from verse 13. It says, And you, having been dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. Now this is where I'm going, verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you remember from the last, uh, when we're doing spiritual authority, if we go to Ephesians 1.21, it says, Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Praise the Lord. In Ephesians 2, it says we were raised up together and seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're in the place of victory. We're fighting from the position of victory. We're not fighting for victory, but if you're not aware of where you are, the position you hold, then it becomes difficult. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are fighting from a position of victory. First John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in Greater is he that is in than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Can we look at the next slide? So I need to I need to explain some things. 
There are two kingdoms in operation. But they're also in conflict. There's the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of light, or the kingdom of his son. But there's also the kingdom of Satan, which is the kingdom of darkness. There are two kingdoms. Now, both kingdoms are highly structured and organized. If you remember what we read in um, Ephesians 12, 6, 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, descending order of hierarchy. So Satan's kingdom is really organized. His army is organized. But so is God's army. So is God's army. Let me explain what I mean. Let's look at Matthew 12, 22 to 28. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 22 to 28. I'll read it from the screen, it's taken. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch as the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how then shall his kingdom stand? So that points out now that Satan has a kingdom. Next verse, please. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them off? Therefore they shall be your judges. Next one. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come upon you. So there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. Also, let's quickly look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1 verse 12 and 13. Colossians 1, verse 12 and 13. It says, Giving thanks to the Father, He has enabled you, I'm reading the NLT, to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from, one, the kingdom of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. So again, two kingdoms. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now let's get a bit more understanding about the heavens and its components. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens with an S. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. If we look at it in 2 Chronicles 2.6, when Solomon was praying at the dedication of the temple, he said, but who is able to build him a temple? Listen to this. 
sits heaven, one heaven, not plural, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Some version use the word highest heaven. Nehemiah 9 6. It says, You're the one. I'm reading the message translation. Sorry, I'm going between translations, but I pick up the translation that brings out the meaning. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You're the one, God, you alone. You make the heavens. One. The heavens of heavens. And all the angels. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 to 4. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 to 4. It says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, this is Paul speaking, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was cut up to the third heaven. And I am no such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Verse 4. How he was caught up into paradise and had inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So what is he saying here? There are many words used. There's heaven, there's heavenly realm, there's heaven of heavens, there's the third heaven. It's saying here that to understand the heaven is there's more than one heaven. When I was a little kid, I just thought beyond the sky is that was heaven. <laughs> Why is not that? The first heaven is the one we see, the visible one. You see the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's the one we all see, don't we? We see the sun, we see the moon, we see the stars. But the passages we, we read also shows that there's a third heaven or the heaven of heavens or the highest heaven. And if you look at the description we read in 2 Corinthians, it's a place of paradise. It's the dwelling place of God. It's where the departed go to, the departed in Christ. The third heaven. But somewhere in between, is where Satan's kingdom is. Somewhere in between is where Satan, Satan's kingdom is. Let's look at Daniel 10. The book of Daniel, chapter 10. I will read from Verse 12. Sorry, chapter, uh, verse 2. When this vision came to me, this is Daniel, he had been praying for three weeks. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time, I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. And then let's hop to verse 12, verse 11. And the man said to me, Daniel, this is the angel, and the angel now um, appeared to him. Daniel, you are very precious to God, so listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince 
of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. So as the angel was coming down with the answer to Daniel, he met resistance. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to me, came to his rescue. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. That's Satan's uh, army. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. So Daniel had prayed. His prayers were received and answered. The angel was sent to bring the answer. But what happened? There was a battle with Satan's army. And so for 21 days, there was that battle. If we go down to verse 20 of the same chapter 10, after the angel had delivered the message he had for Daniel, it says, do you know why I have, I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So the battle was not over. He was still going back to fight. He came to give Daniel the message, left Angel Gabriel, I mean, uh, Michael still fighting, and he was going back. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against this spirit princess except Michael, your spirit prince. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Maybe if I read it in the Amplified, you will understand it better. It says in Amplified five verse thirteen, but the prince of the do not be afraid, Daniel. From the first day you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before the Lord, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your word. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in opposition to me for twenty one days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief of the celestial princes, came to help me, for I had been there with the king of Persia. And in verse 20, it says, Then he said, Do you understand fully why I came to you? Now I return to fight against the hostile prince of Persia. And when I am gone, behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. This just shows you that there is a battle. And it also shows you what happened. The angels left heaven and had to battle before the message or the prayer answers to the prayer was received. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, one thing I would like you to note, when Daniel was praying, when Daniel started praying, what happened? It set all the heavens into motion. It just shows you the power of prayer. When we pray, it sets the heavens into motion. There is power in prayer. Amen. There is power in prayer. Amen. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So we go on to the battle. In 2 Corinthians 2 11, it says, We are not ignorant of Satan and his devices. The battle is not physical. 
says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we are not contending with a physical opponent. Which is why sometimes it is not your co-worker. It is not your boss. It is not your auntie. It's not your uncle. It's the force behind. It is the force behind. And if you get to understand that, you spend less words fighting your co-worker or fighting your boss or fighting whoever it is. Or fighting your auntie or your uncle. You spend less time. It's not physical. The battle is not physical. The battle is spiritual. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And Satan is very cunning. He comes in in different ways. Second Corinthians ten three to five. I'm reading the amplified. It says. For though we walk in the flesh as mortal men, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. So what is that saying? That you need the appropriate weapon for the warfare you're facing. For spiritual warfare, you cannot go with the weapons of man. So using your mouth to get mad at the person doesn't help. Using your mouth to say all sorts of things because you feel you're justified by getting angry and saying what you need to say to the person. If it's a spiritual thing, it doesn't help. You're talking to the you're doing the wrong thing, you're wasting your energy. I'll say that again. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. Sorry, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh using the weapons of man. If it's a spiritual weapon, you don't need your gun.